top leaders, meaningful conversation, actionable advice, bulldoze complacency, ignite inspiration, create impact, produced by Southwestern family of companies. This is the Action Catalyst. Today, we are joined by the one and only Dan Moore, who's no stranger to listeners here on the Action Catalyst, having hosted the show for the last five years. In addition to his duties here, Dan has served as the longtime president of Southwestern Advantage, a role from which he has recently retired, which frees him up to chat with us today. Hey, Adam. Very similar jackets on today, buddy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. From the waist down, I'm wearing gym shorts. That's the secret. It's your pant. Well, Dan, it, it's super good to to see you again. It's a, a role reversal for what you're used to, which is typically the person doing the interviewing on the Action Catalyst. And today we have the the opportunity to grill you with the same questions you used to grill everybody else with. Well, I'm going to start by saying I'm totally guilty so we can save the trial, and save the cross X. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. We have a lot to talk about. And Dan, you and I have, have a, a long history of working together compared to people from the outside world where long in today's tenure of working with someone in a company is about three years. We've known each other for about 17. Um, Dan Moore, I can probably speak for you, can say he probably has known people that he's worked with for 25, 30 years, maybe more. So uh, is it safe to say you keep up with someone? Absolutely true. I actually talked to the person that got me into the business world two weeks ago. So we keep in touch. He interviewed me in January of 1974, when I was a freshman in college. And then also Dave Causer, who's the president of Southwestern Advantage, was in many ways my first mentor, somebody I sought out for advice at the end of my very first summer. So we've been colleagues and friends for nearly just shy of a half a century. So keeping up with these great relationships, so important. My own district sales leader, keep in touch with him. The former president of the company, Jerry Heffel, we stay in regular contact. In addition to people like Henry Bedford, the chairman of our board, I've known Henry since 1978. So we are going to continue to stay in contact. I have such respect and admiration for Henry. So there's no or no way in the world I'm going to lose that contact. Yeah. It's really amazing. I mean, in any part of history, I think being in one organization for half a century, uh, I like to put it that way, is a feat. I mean, it's it's something that's simply not done often. You know, so many people probably would have questions listening to this podcast about that, but what kept you around? Well, I could finally tell you the truth, Adam. I never had enough confidence to go through job interviews. <laughs> it was, it was, you didn't want to put yourself out there, right? Just it's safer here and stay. I'm sure that's the truth. Well, it's interesting because I never even created a resume. Uh, when, when I was in college, I was encouraged to do one. So I remember getting out my old uh, typewriter to even go to the museum and see typewriters. I started typing and I re read back the first word I wrote, which was resume, but I misread it and thought it said resume. So I just went back to work. <laughs> wow. Anyway, in, in more seriousness, I think what made such a difference in my tenure here is deep, deep conviction in the mission that we have. You know, when I got into the program as an 18-year-old, I was kind of shiny on the outside and pretty messed up on the inside. I was going to Harvard, evidently had everything in the world going for me, but inside was a massive insecurities, no real anchors in my life, and I desperately needed some path that I could get on that could restore my self-confidence and self-image and be around people that would really bring out the best in me. But when I met my student manager and then my district sales leader, there's just something about those gentlemen and the other student leaders in the program that I get to know the first years, a similar striving to be the best that we could possibly be. And so the program was massively important to me. That first summer got me really back on track, back feeling good about myself. I got back to college and immediately forgot every lesson of the summer. It took less than 24 hours for me to f feel like I just lost it all. So I needed a second dose for sure, which was the next summer. And with the guidance of the district sales leader and other people, I came back and began to build a team, build an organization, began to really fulfill these habits. So in many ways, because the program was such a massive impact on me, I felt if this could be for me, it could work for somebody else. And partly because my own upbringing was, we should make the world better when we leave it than we found it. I said, I could spend an awful lot of years trying to find the best way to help the world, or I could find the focus on what I've got going right now and help the world from right here. So that deep, deep conviction of the mission, first of all, personally experiencing the benefits, second, seeing so many other people grow, and then having the opportunity to develop other skills within the company, there was, there was no need to think about doing anything else. That said, I was distracted a fair amount in my 20s, as many people are, by something that looks cooler and better and more lucrative. But each time, with great guidance from my most important life advisor, that's my wife, Maria, 
she would constantly say, but what drives you? What moves you? What motivates you in the mornings? What gets you out of bed? What makes you feel good about your work? And it always came back to the same thing, seeing young people grow and develop, then become slightly older, then become leaders in their own right, and live good, productive, happy lives. That's what drives me. And she said, can you accomplish that here? And I said, of course, I feel like I am right now. She said, then why would you even think about going anywhere else? And it was like, well, that really makes sense to me, honey. So she's always been really good at grounding me, not telling me what to do, but asking the right questions so that I could come to that conclusion. So I guess it's a combination of external influences and internal conviction. And at some point I just finally said, who am I kidding? This is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is what, this is what I am meant to do. And I quit looking right, quit looking left, and just focus on looking forward. Mm, that's such a good answer. I uh, think in passing, we've talked a little bit about you growing up in New Mexico, right? That's right. Los Alamos, New Mexico is my hometown. And if I remember right, you said your dad was a engineer of some type. Well, my dad was a mathematical statistician. He had a PhD in that subject and was one of the early guys working on computer programming at the lab there at Los Alamos National Laboratory. So he started working there in 1953 when a computer would fill basically an auditorium or a gymnasium and would run almost as fast as a hand calculator will run now. So he was very involved in that. And Los Alamos National Lab at that time was primarily in nuclear weapons development. Making weapons of mass destruction provided the living for our family. And my dad, a very principled man, kind of made the decision after roughly 20 years that that's not how he wanted his whole life to be spent. So he re-engineered himself and, and found other work still in the public sector. He always was a public sector employee. That decision to leave it was very steady, secure, safe work to follow a principle definitely had an impact on me. So yeah, Los Alamos is a really important part of my upbringing. It's there that a friend got me into the speech and debate team, which was a, a funny story in its own right, because at the time I was playing basketball. Now you're a tall fella, Adam. I'm not very tall, but I was the same height when I was 12. So I was a pretty good basketball player and and uh, my buddy said, you ought to join the speech team. And I said, why do I want to do that? He said, well, there's two reasons. First of all, there's twice as many girls as there are guys on the team. <laughs> and second, I think you could learn a lot and be good at it. So I went to the first meeting and sure enough, it was a great experience. So we started getting involved in competitive speaking and debating. Uh, the girl I was dating at the time got me into choir and got me into theater. And so in my career, the benefits of being exposed to public speaking and theatrical performance have had a huge, huge impact. So the NBA lost a real star, <laughs> but those upbringings, uh, experiences in Los Alamos were super, super helpful to me. My old speech teacher, Paul Black, probably is gonna listen to this episode. He's still living at the age of 90 something. That's incredible. And a number of us have been fundraising for renaming part of the auditorium for Ross and Lola Ramsey, who are our drama teachers. So these impacts from way back have definitely paid forward and hopefully helping other people too. So your dad is this, mathematician that's obviously brilliant enough to be hired to work on these things. And typically one doesn't think deep mathematical labor for a career as being correlative to high level communication skills, which is a stereotype. But I'm thinking in my head, how did Dan not end up being Bill Gates and a computer whiz or mathematician versus public speaking and personal development? Similar to your dad, different than your dad, what, what was it that drove you kind of a, a more of a, I guess, kind of a liberal arts direction? You know, gene pools are not circular, nor are they of uniform depth. So not all those mathematical genes passed on to me. They, they skipped me and got to my son instead. I could do math, but it was kicking and screaming. So it was not, not a natural attribute of my own. But my dad started off as a journalism major and had an amazing sense of humor. He could really spin a story. He could write brilliantly. So that part did stick with me, the writing skills, being able to be a good storyteller, making people laugh. These are things that I, I'm sure got from him. My mother as well, who is an artist. So the, these impacts from our parents hit us in different ways. So Bill Gates was actually a classmate of mine, although we never met. And I, I've always admired what he accomplished out of his dorm room. At the same time, I was trying to accomplish something else out of my dorm room. How incredible is that? You guys were the same class. Well, we were. He never actually graduated. He was a little bit busy building his small enterprise called Microsoft. <laughs> and, and you just couldn't manage to recruit him to, uh, to our company. I don't, th I don't think we ever met. I doubt we ever crossed paths. But had he, it could have even changed his future too. <laughs> so there you go. I'd have done well. That's right. Well, so you came to Southwestern Advantage and over the course of your career, you ended up taking over the role eventually as president. And so 2007 to today, what are, what are some ways 
you feel like you've really shaped the company for the future or some of the, the changes that you feel like have occurred inside Southwestern Advantage since your, your tenure as president? Well, as, as president of the company, I was privileged to work with Henry Bedford, who was chairman and CEO, and he was my direct boss for a number of years in there. And Henry is a real visionary. He can take a look at where we are in the business and forecast something around the corner that nobody else can even see to the corner. And he quickly identified that we need to be in the online sphere as well as selling hardcover print books, and that we need to have a recurring revenue model to benefit everybody, not only the company, but the students and the consumers, because this recurring online revenue can be updated regularly, so they're getting better and better product all the time. And so a big part of my role was to help facilitate that mission and help make sure that those things happened in a really good way. And I've often said, and I believe this, that Henry may have saved the company by developing this model and being willing to invest and put that energy into it. So I feel like a big part of my role as president was to help facilitate the mission. And that means being a great link between what the students do and what the sales leaders do and what the overall corporate philosophy and structure is about. In the old uh, Hippocratic Oath, the first thing that doctors pledge is do no harm. Mm -hmm. When I became president of the company, one of my great concerns was, can I even do this thing? This is a legacy of more than 100 years. And it was a really scary thought. So I said, if I just stay true to the mission and stay focused on doing what's right for young people, I won't do any harm. And then I want to make it better by continuing to amplify the notion of doing the right thing. So our values, our focus, doing the right thing, staying true to our mission have been things that I've tried my very, very best to maintain and help other people see that as well. You know, soon after I became president, we had the major housing crash in 2008, 2009. Whole country was in recession. It was, it was not a fun time to be in any kind of a business. And I remember giving a presentation at our great recruiter seminar. Theme basically was, if there's going to be a recession, we're just not going to participate. And here's why we're not. And it was a lot of our background, our history, our theme. And I feel like that may have been a moment when I, when I stepped up to say, let's lean into our values. Let's lean into what's always made us successful. Let's don't worry about externalities. Let's focus on who we are, where we've been, and carry that forward. Over the years, I've developed a presentation that I do for young people that I call Life 101. And Life 101 is basically, if you're going to choose a, a lifetime partner, how do you go about doing that? Hmm. So through the course of that, I felt like it was not dictating who to, who to marry or who to spend your time with, but instead learn to ask the right questions. Hmm. Everybody wants to find the answers, but I really think if we ask the right questions, the answers ultimately reveal themselves. So I feel like that's been a, a presentation that hopefully has continued to be impactful and make a difference. When I travel campuses, both in Europe and in the U.S., the whole focus is to be a spokesperson of our mission, which is developing young people. So the presentations that I give are generally not at all about selling, generally not at all about recruiting but more about understanding how our brains work, how our minds work, how our hearts work, so that we can pull together a, a statement for ourselves we want to move forward in life. I've been blessed with a tremendous team of people in the office. They'll tell you that I'm definitely not the best, best manager because I'm generally not a present manager, usually gone someplace. But they've carried on just brilliantly making sure that the backbone and the infrastructure of the company continue to grow regardless of the obstacles. And I can't give them enough credit for what happened during the pandemic years when we had to really retool, when we faced the very real prospect we weren't going to be able to sell anything door to door. We really stepped up to innovate in such good ways and to really figure out how we could sell if we couldn't go door to door. Fortunately, we were able to do that, but that's been a permanent change that's implemented while we've impacted what we've done in our company. With our European people unable to come due to the travel ban, we had to get really creative there. So I was very involved in reopening the UK so that they'd have a place that they could knock and sell books, retain that group of people for the future. If we believe anything that we try to teach about overcoming obstacles, developing themselves through persevering, through getting through every possible setback, and we'd been very hypocritical if we hadn't found a way to make it happen. In fact, a big part of our whole motto as a company is find a way. Anybody can find an excuse, but it takes a person of real character to find a way over, around, under, or right through any obstacle that stands in, in their path. So finding a way was such an important theme so getting through those adversities is, is a matter of, of character, and it's a matter of belief, and it's a matter of teamwork, because nobody can do that stuff alone. There's an old saying that what's hardest about our business is what's best about it. Don't take it personally. Be the best person you can be. That there's certain things in life they can control. They should really control those. There's other things they should influence. But there's a huge number of things they just need to accept for now. It's what we call the CIA FN philosophy. Control what you can, influence what you can, accept what you need to for now and just roll forward. So 
I guess it's been an activist role in certain ways. It's been a passing of the baton role in other ways. It's trying to make sure that our mission is first and foremost in people's hearts and minds. And um, the legacy of the past and the responsibility of the future have always weighed strongly on me. Yeah. Well, I think you've done a wonderful job. I think in particular, what a lot of people would say, and just in conversations with a lot of my peers, when uh, your name comes up, there's always a warmth to it because uh, what you've done such a wonderful job of is representing a lot of those values that we stand for as a company. And you've made a tremendous impact on, gosh, probably 50 to 100,000 young people, which is really incredible. What would you say you hope the point is that they remember the principle that they remember most? I would say the one thing is to develop a strong set of values and to live those values focused on making the world a little bit better than than you found it. That it's pretty easy to be an accumulator. It's pretty easy to be a taker, especially if you have a lot of talent and you're persuasive. But can a person be an accumulator and then a giver at the same time, making the world a better place, not just financially, but in terms of impact? Mm. That's always what I would encourage people to do. Probably a second lesson is don't neglect the acres of diamonds that are around you. You may be familiar with that story. Uh, for those of the listeners that don't know it, it's told by Russell Conwell, who was the founder of Temple University, that a very poor hard scrabble farmer in South Africa was finally fed up with farming and he said, I want to find riches. This is never going to work for me. So he sold his farm and went on questing for diamonds and ended up penniless and, and passed away totally broke. Whoever had bought his farm was one day working down by the stream and noticed something shiny in the water and pulled it out. And it was an immense, uncut, almost perfectly developed diamond. And that led to finding other diamonds, other diamonds, other diamonds. And it became one of the most prosperous, successful diamond mines in the entire world. And so the person that gave it up literally gave up acres of diamonds that were in his backyard in pursuit of something somewhere else. I've always felt like if we can concentrate on what we have at hand, if a couple of things are in place, if the opportunity is a fair one, if it's honest, if it's decent, if it's fair, if the people we're surrounded with have good values, then why look elsewhere? Let's develop the acres of diamonds that are right here with us. Those would be a couple of lessons. Have the right values and, and don't spend all your time diverting attention and diffusing your energies. Look around. Are there acres of diamonds around you right now? Can you bloom where you plant it? Mm. That's a big one. Yeah. That cliche of the, the pasture's always greener on the other side is kind of a similar story, right? He just reminded me of one of my dad's favorite quotes. He had a a sign in his office wall as a government worker that said, the grass is brown on both sides of the fence. <laughs> Great. Well, you, you know, just a quick transition from this with you as the host of the Action Catalyst, you've learned a lot from having interviews with other people. And mm -hmm. I'm curious in, in all the interviews that you've had since uh, taking on the, the host role in 2018, what, what's one that, that really stands out to you as most memorable or something that you gained as an insight? Well, there've been a number of specific insights, but if you don't mind, I'm going to try to generalize them a little bit. Sure. I developed over time a, a system of using basically the same five questions in my interviews. And one of the questions is, what do you do when you hit a brick wall? Mm -hmm. And the other one is, what do you do when you, if you have somebody that's so completely discouraged, they don't know where to turn. And it's amazing how similar the responses were. Almost everybody, when they hit a brick wall, said, well, the first thing you got to do is realize you've hit a brick wall. Just acknowledge it, but don't make it a big thing. Just say, okay, so I'm temporarily have a setback. This isn't going the way I wanted it to, but it doesn't mean it can't eventually in a different way. And to be creative, step back, breathe, and think, and then go at it again. Because nobody ever says when you hit a brick wall, give up. Never had a single guest say that. <laughs> and one of them said, it's a normal part. If you weren't experiencing those, then you wouldn't be doing anything remarkable. So that was immensely encouraging that whenever we hit this unexpected stuff, giving up is the only option that makes no sense at all. Keeping on does if we think use our brains the other huge inspiration that i remember getting was with the question what would you say to a person that is so discouraged and they look at the hand they've been dealt they don't have any face cards let alone any aces what would you say to that person and it's amazing how many of them said i would encourage them to dig into their life and find one or two things they feel great about themselves and then second lean into people around them that can remind them of their capabilities and third do something do something successful it doesn't matter how big it is. Just do one thing successful, feel better about yourself and get into motion. Matt Ross often says motivation is a myth. Momentum is what makes the difference. And so when people have lost their momentum, getting it started again can take a lot of effort. But when they do that and just take that next positive step, great things in fact can occur. 
really well said, and I know we're almost on time, but I, I did want to ask you, I guess, one last thing, which is you also have the question of asking about pivot points. But I'm kind of curious if you've had to isolate maybe one major pivot point in your professional career, you know, a, a challenging moment, a pivot point that you've encountered that, that made all the difference. What, what do you think it would be? There have been a number of them, Adam, from really early on, realizing the impact that a sales manager can have on a young person. And the sales managers have an awesome responsibility to be the right kind of leader. Really, really important. So that's that's a principle there. When I was asked to become a district sales manager and I didn't think I was qualified or capable of doing it, the sales director nodded and said, yeah, you can do this. You can do this. We'll help you get through it. He also said, it's important to make a long-term commitment because somewhere along the line, you're going to have a really tough year. And if you're not committed, you're going to want to leave. And I said, well, I'm never going to have a tough year. But the very next year, I had my worst year ever. So his wisdom came through. Then when he became president of the company in 1980, he asked me if I would join him as sort of a, a head of projects. It didn't really have a title that made any sense. I was called manager of marketing development. I still don't know what that even means. And he just said, I think you can do this. That's a beautiful one. As a, a tenured and seasoned and uh, salted beard individual that you are today, what, what advice might you give to a, a 20 or 21 year old Dan Moore? If you sat down with him, knowing everything that you know about your life and all the wisdom that you have now, what would be one one little bit of advice you might share to your your twenty one year old self? I would say put the correct kind of emotional blinders on, so that we stay focused on what's ahead, and not get too distracted by naysayers, not get too distracted by alternative ways of doing things, because there's always going to be a million alternatives. And I see so many people fritter away their energy pursuing all those instead of concentrating on the one right in front of them. Mm. Stay the course, stay focused. Again, if the people you work with are honest, if the mission is noble, if it's pure, if it has value to the world, those are not easy things to find. In fact, my, my successor, Dave Causer, used to say, you know, there must be a million ways to make a million dollars. But I only know of a couple of them, and they usually involve building value within the company you're in. And so that's what I'm focused on. So there's, there's a lot to that. Just everybody's chasing the next shiny thing instead of saying, wait a minute, what can I create out of what I have right here? Yeah, acres of diamonds, way to circle back to that point. Well, Dan, it's been a pleasure. You've made an incredible impact. Appreciate that. Appreciate your time as the Action Catalyst uh, host and appreciate you giving me massive giant shoes to, to try and fill with my small feet. <laughs> Adam, you're very kind. It's fun to have a role reversal in this process. I appreciate it. You got it. I'll have PTSD after this thinking about what I should have said. <laughs> if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. And to stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst Podcast and on Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. And thanks for listening.